Welcome to Transformative Principle, where you learn how to be a leader and not just a manager of a to-do list. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can find me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. Your to-do list is a hungry monster that is never satisfied. For the last year and a half, I've helped principals get awards, get promoted, and find the time to do the work that really matters. I recently opened a new mastermind slot. Schedule a call with me and let's overcome the stressed and isolated principal position together. Go to the show notes for this episode at transformativeprincipal.org and click schedule a call with Jethro. Thank you to our sponsor, Can Do You. Can Do You helps busy principals create the school culture they've always dreamed of through motivational speeches, engaging videos, and leadership camps that are packaged together for schools that want to see real change. Go to candoyou.us slash Jethro to schedule your call today. And if you sign up before the end of the summer, you'll receive a big, huge TV for your lobby to recognize all the amazing things that your students are doing every single day. That's can do you. C-A-N-D-O, the letter U, dot U-S, slash Jethro. Welcome to Transformative Principle, episode 225. Wow, these are just flying by. This is amazing. If you didn't hear the first part of this interview with Tom Herr last week, you definitely should go check it out. That was really a good conversation. He shared a way to talk about the formative five success skills with parents that will really get them engaged. And to get just that little piece, uh, go to my website, transformativeprincipal.org, and uh, just put your email address in there, and I'll send that right to you so you've got it. Thank you so much for listening to Transformative Principal, and here's the second part of my interview with Tom Herr. So then to back up, you know, a dozen paragraphs, you asked me the question about the formative five, and I think one way to look at them, and you're right, it's others in itself. And the school that I ran for 34 years was a multiple intelligence school. And we spent a lot of time talking about Howard Gardner's personal intelligence, his interpersonal, which is reading other people, understanding them. Daniel Goleman would call that managing relationships. And then intrapersonal, which is really knowing yourself, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, Daniel Goleman would call that managing yourself. And it seems to me when you look at the formative five, there's kind of a, of a breakdown, if you will. Certainly when you look at empathy, that's relationships, that's tapping into other people. When you look at self-control, that's really managing yourself. And, and in my book, as is, is you've probably already seen, at the end of each chapter, each one of these formative five, I have suggestions for principles and strategies for teachers. So I'm giving them ways to do that. Um, integrity is an inter, if you will, because it's really not only the relationship with other people. Integrity is taking a stand. It's visibly acting on your beliefs. Then you have embracing diversity, and certainly that's engaging other people. And then the last one, grit, is intrapersonal. That's pushing yourself. And so it seems to me as we prepare children to develop these skills, whether they're five-year-olds or high school seniors, We need to really be thinking about what's the best way to do that. And some of that, of course, is them developing it within themselves and others is them developing it within the context of other people, likely their classmates. And it's like you said, it's it's very difficult to measure that. But when you see it and you actually see it happening, you know how powerful it is. And, you know, I just want to share a brief story about a student that I worked with that was had so many challenges in his life. And there was nothing that anybody could do to bring him to a place where he could actually like cope effectively in school until he had a teacher who believed that he was more than his disability. And this kid would storm out of class, he would punch walls, he would threaten to fight people all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was he was just angry all the time. And, you know, we kept working with him, believing in him. And, um, you know, we talked about some of these things a lot and how he had to persevere through these challenging things. And one day he, when he left class, we said, look, we don't care if you leave class, but you just need to come to a place where we know where you are. Right. And so he wouldn't do that because he didn't want to have to get in trouble. And the office was the place where we knew somebody would always be. And then one day uh, he had a substitute teacher who 
honestly was a real jerk and was not treating him with respect. He got mad, as he often did when he had a sub, left the room and came down to the office and sat down in the office. And I came out and talked to him and I said, so what happened? And he said, what happened? And then I said, and what did you do? And he said, I just got up and left the room. And I said, you didn't yell at him. You didn't threaten him. You didn't like make him think that you were going to beat him up. And he said, no. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's awesome. Congratulations. I am so proud of you. It's great. And like that self-control was so hard for him. And yet he was able to say, no, I'm not going to do it this time. Yep. I'm going to go to where I know I'll be respected and treated appropriately. And that will be, that's how I'll deal with it. And it worked. And I said, by all means, stay down here and you can do work. Sit here. It's much better for you to be here than in that room where that guy was not treating you appropriately. Good for you. Yeah, it was amazing. So powerful I to like see it. that tiny step of self-control that made a huge impact on him and his future. I know that. So let, let me give you kind of a similar story, which which is, I think, powerful that I saw last semester. Let me back up a bit. So w when you were introducing me, you mentioned the fact that since 2004, I've been writing the Principal Connection and Educational Leadership. And so I've written, what's that, uh, 14 years, eight. I've written, you know, over 100 columns, and I've probably got about 100 favorites. But one that I talk about a lot was called The Schoolhouse at Midnight. And I wrote this probably 10 years ago. And my, my premise was you're a principal, you're lying in bed at midnight, aliens come from another planet, they awaken you, they take you to your school, you turn on the lights. And my question is, what can you infer about a school when there's nobody there? What can you tell from what's in the halls, what's on the walls? And I talked about that a great, I'm a big believer that that's an opportunity for us to celebrate kids' success uh, the messages and so forth and so on. So, paragraph. Uh, one of the things I've been doing for the past couple of years is I'm working at the University of Missouri St. Louis in our principal preparation program. And I teach a class in school culture. And then I supervise master's degree students who are in schools earning their administrative hours. So, what that means is, you know, 15, 20 times a semester, I'm going to schools and I'm visiting, which is really fun. It's great being in schools. Well, inevitably, when I go to a school, the principal is late for the meeting. Well, I was late, too, so I get that. And that's kind of fun because I get to go around in the hall and take photos and see what's happening. Well, I was in a school last spring, and I went out in the hall, and they had a trophy case. And, you know, it was filled with the usual trophies. This team won this championship. That player won that MVP award, da-da-da-da-da. But next to that, there was a plaque, and it had names of about 10 students. This was a high school. But the plaque was most improved attendance. It wasn't best attendance. It was most improved. And the first name, there was some young girl, and it had plus 7%. And then the second kid was plus 5, and it went down to like plus 4 and 3. And it didn't give the percentage. And I thought, how cool was that? Because I'm sure the girl who gained 7, she probably didn't go from an 88 to a 95. Yeah. You know, she might have gone from a 50 to a 57. but here we are recognizing kids' trajectories. We're recognizing their progress. Uh, we're looking at self-control. Whatever this girl was doing, she was improving due to self-control, and we were celebrating her. Too often, when I go in the halls, I see lots of stuff, up, lots of kids' work. But sometimes I think, you know, all the things that are up here represent just the top 10% of the kids. They represent, there's the honor roll. Uh, there's the kids with perfect attendance. There's the MVP. But what about the kids who really have shown self-control? For that matter, what about the kids who've shown empathy? I would argue that principals, what a great opportunity for a principal and her faculty to sit down and talk about if empathy is important, how can we reflect that in the hall? What can we have there so that when they come out of the spaceship and get me at midnight, we can see that empathy is important at this school, and here's what some children have done to show that they're learning empathy. What can we do with self-control, with integrity, with diversity, with grit? And to me, that's the kind of dialogue we ought to be having in school. Grant Wiggins said, what you measure is what you value. And when we look at what goes up on the walls, what goes in the halls, we're really talking about what it is we value as a school community.
Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a really powerful example. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a big, huge thing to make that impact for our students. Like that girl who had the 7% increase in attendance, that's just a little thing on, on the wall. That's not, you know, you're not throwing a big party or doing something like that, but you're recognizing her right. individually. And I think that's really important. I'll share a link with you later. And those who are listening can find it in the show notes at transformativeprincipal.org. But it's to the TED Talk that I gave where we rate Rose attendance in our school from 85% to 95% and then maintained it. Wow. Congratulations. Well, here's the thing, Tom. It, it wasn't a lot. All we did is recognize that the kids were doing it, whether they were doing it or not. We just recognized what they were doing. We didn't like throw a party. We didn't do incentives. Like we did all that first and none of those changed our attendance. What we did do is every day on the announcements, we got on, well, not on the announcements, like two and a half hours after school started when we saw that everybody was there, we would uh, just announce what the percentage was for each grade level. And so by just saying that and recognizing where they were and saying our goal is 95%, kindergarten is at this percentage and whatever for each grade, that got it to get all the way up to 95% and then just stay there. Wow, I like that. Yeah, and it wasn't a tough thing to do. It just required us to to recognize that kids were making an effort and we didn't even do it individually. And there was no prize for it. If kids got above 95%, they were allowed to scream and yell until the next grade was announced. <laughs> <laughs> and That's good. Yeah, it was so much fun and the kids loved it. And the reason I'll, I'll send you the link is because there's pictures. We took video of the kids screaming when they had their attendance read and, and it was, it's powerful and it's exciting to see it happen firsthand. Nice. Yeah. So going back to the idea of measuring this, you have self-assessments for how in the book of how adults look at empathy and these other success skills. How do we measure it and recognize it with students? Well, a couple things. And I'm going to, if you will, go into further details of sophistication. The first level, not unlike what you just talked about with your attendance, it seems to me that if a school is going to embrace the formative five, uh, what we need to do is we talk about that. Uh, when I was a school principal, you know, it was in my parent letters. I sent home a digital parent letter every Friday. It was in what I had in the halls. When we had parent meetings, I talked about it. So at one level, there was simply promoting it, talking about it, having people be aware of it so that they know about it. it at a second level, then I think there was talking about it, faculty meetings, talking about it with teachers. In our school's mission, one of the phrases that we had was joyful learning. And my, my bias for that is I believe when you walk in a school, you should see smiles. You should see kids smiling and you should see adults smiling. And it doesn't mean there's a lack of rigor. It doesn't mean kids aren't being challenged, but it means, hey, we want to be here. So one faculty meeting, what I did is I threw the mission statement up on uh, on overhead transparency. That's how long ago that was. Yeah. And I had joyful learning in red. And I said to the teachers, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to think. And then I want you to turn and share and talk about what is it you've done to pursue joyful learning? Well, once again, the faculty are the faculty. The room just erupted with people talking. I couldn't get them to stop. So likewise, I have done that at faculty meetings with the formative five. And sometimes I've said, hey, next week we're going to talk about empathy or let's talk about grit. Uh, one, when we got into grit years ago, one of the things I said to teachers is I wanted them to talk about grit with their kids on Friday and say to the kids on Monday, when we come back, I'm going to ask you what grit you used over the weekend. And again, at a kindergarten level, that's not very sophisticated. It's a whole lot better. We went through grade six, but it's putting it on everybody's radar screen. At the deepest level, though, when you talk about assessment, let me tell you what I'm doing. And by the way, Jethro, you or I can give people my email because I'd be happy to hear from them if they want to follow up with information on this. One of the things that I've been doing is I go to schools and I'll do presentations on the formative five. And after I'll do that, what I will then have the faculty do is develop rubrics that they can use to measure the formative five. You know, inadequate, satisfactory, acceptable, and then exemplary. What does that look like? Uh, what are the levels? And I find that putting teachers in groups it's really a powerful way to get them to think about that. One of the things that I've done a couple of times that's really fun is I've gone to schools where they've had 
maybe as low as 20 and another school had probably 50. And I put the pharma to five on a newsprint in different spots in the room. And I let teachers choose where they wanted to go. And I remember talking with the principal ahead of time. And I said, what do you think about this? And he said, well, that's going to be good because by where they choose, they're voting with their feet. That's going to let me know what they really think is important and where we need to emphasize. So the teachers get in a group. Uh, they come up with rubrics. And I've been surprised probably in 20 to 30 minutes, teachers can do rubrics, do a really good job, and then we'll have them share. So then when you've got those rubrics, then it seems to me that's a way of using that twofold. One is, most, most important, I think, is to help kids reflect on what are the varying levels of performance for each of these success skills. There's, the bottom line is you want kids taking ownership for their learning and letting kids know what does this look like if I'm going to be exemplary with integrity, what does that mean? So the first, I think, is internal with your kids, but then also what a wonderful tool to send that to parents and whether you actually just send it out and publicize it, whether you attach it to your regular report card uh, and say this is for discussion at home, whether you attach it to your report card and say we've had your children fill this out at school, it might be fun for you to talk about this with them, or whether a teacher even assesses the kids. I mean, there's various ways of doing that. My bias would be I really like kids taking ownership. So I think it'd be really wonderful for the teacher to have the rubric in front of the room, talk about it, and say to kids, okay, this week is going to be empathy week, or this month is going to be. At the end of that period, we're all going to fill out this rubric, and kids look at it, they see it, they own it, and it's a way of them kind of focusing themselves and monitoring their progress. Yeah, I love that. So two things to comment on that. Number one, just uh, last week or the week before, maybe a couple of weeks ago, Leslie Goodrum, I interviewed, she's doing the Midland Values Project in Midland, Texas, and is doing exactly what you just talked about, where each month they focus on a different success trait. Uh, they're using different words for some of them, but integrity's in there, empathy's in there. and Wonderful. And it's it's fascinating, but they're doing it school-wide and they're talking about it all the time. And it's it's very powerful. Another one that I did an interview with Michael Shapiro about that, about his school where it's a competency-based system, but instead of just having an academic, they also have what they call PSS. And I don't remember what the PSS stands for, but those are basically these same kind of skills that they need to learn. But what's cool about it is that they have four different levels and it's a six through 12 or seven through 12 school. And virtually nobody gets to level four of their PSS because that is so advanced that they don't get there and it takes them two years to get through the other ones. So instead of just like getting like mastering these skills in one year or because you learn mm -hmm. in one month, they recognize and value and force the idea of having grit and determination to get through the time that it takes to demonstrate these skills yep. for real, because it doesn't happen overnight and you can identify these little things, but that doesn't mean that that person has truly become that kind of person yet. It's a process that takes time and some adults, they haven't learned it yet. And so I like that. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing. So if you go to transformativeprinciple.org and search for either of those, you'll be able to, to hear more about them. And I'll put those links in the show notes for this episode too. Tom, I this has been a great conversation. I can't believe that our time has gone by so fast. <laughs> so I think we could probably talk for a couple more hours and I think I may have to have you back on again to talk more. That would be a treat. But the last question that I ask is, what is one thing, after all we've talked about, one thing that a principal can do this week to be a transformative principal like you? Well, first of all, I'm not sure I was a transformative principal. I tried. I did some things well, but I always say to people, uh, I'm not as good as I write, and I'm not as good as I speak about. So I hope that I was. That's um, great. Well, that's, that's, that's true. What, what, what I think principals, what we want, and I know how hard it is, we need a dialogue with our faculty. We need to be in dialogue with them. In my book, Pharma to Five, one of the things I talked about a lot is you don't do the Pharma to Five to kids. You do it with kids. And I think the way to do that is by having the faculty embrace it. So to me, 
if if I like the pharma to five and I'm really into this, the first thing I'm going to do is get a subgroup, a steering committee, my faculty, and talk about it because I want them to get excited and enthusiastic. I think change comes about through concentric circles. So once I've got that little circle, then we're going to widen it and we're going to expand it. So by the time we really are moving forward on this, every teacher believes as fervently as I do that what we need to do is prepare children for success in life and not just settle for success in school. So having those dialogues with the teachers, being part of the learning community, I'm there with them, I think is a way where everybody in the building benefits. Yeah, that is really powerful. And Tom, how do people connect with you and learn more from you? Oh, thank you. Uh, let me spell my email address. Uh, first of all, they can go to my website, which is Thomas R. Her, that's H-O-E-R-R dot com. Or if they want to send me an email, it is T-R, my first and middle initial, T-R, her, H-O-E-R-R at New City School, that's singular, not plural, dot org. T-R-H-O-E-R-R at newcityschool.org. And I guarantee and promise I will answer the emails. Uh, being a principal is a wonderful honor, but it's also wonderfully lonely. And I'm happy to help if I can. Well, uh, thank you so much for your generosity in that. And he will answer. He answered mine. And if he answered mine, he'll probably answer yours too. So, <laughs> oh, Thank you so much again for being part of Transformative Principal. Hey. Take care. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Well, I really enjoyed that interview. I hope you did as well. Thank you so much for listening. And again, if you want to get that little snippet about how to engage with your parents, uh, that would be transformativeprincipal.org. Just go to the show notes and enter your email address, and I'll be sure to send that over to you. Thank you so much for listening to Transformative Principal. It means a lot to me, and I appreciate you taking the time to share your ears with me. Thanks so much. Transformative Principal is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators by educators. Visit edupodcastnetwork.com for more great podcasts.